Okay, today's session is Did I Miss Something? Recent SID features. We just wanted to do a quick kind of overview of the things that um, have been recent updates in the last year or so, sprinkled in with some reminders of things that we think sometimes slip through the cracks. And I do want to point out that uh, Mary is in the chat. She's monitoring and adding content to the chat room. So you'll see links to slides, today's slides, as well as I think we have one handout um, coming up. So just keep your eye on the chat. And also we did upload the presentation to the SCED app. So you can find it there as well if you want to follow along. So what we're going to cover today, some of the features and improvements that have happened in the last year are uh, something we call the class interaction or otherwise known as delivery model, which is very closely linked to the hotline. So we'll go over that. That was something new we added. It, it was a class descriptor basically that we added last fall. And then the big E is the E intakes or online registration. We'll talk quickly through that. Some volunteer training options were adjusted and changed in SID to align with what the uh, volunteer, the new volunteer policy of what uh, types of training volunteers should be attending. And so in SID, you can track which trainings your volunteers have attended. We have a little something new called the remote instruction link, which we added a while ago, but I know it kind of slipped through the cracks and folks haven't really necessarily seen it. So we're gonna point that out. We have a few newer reports and some updates to older reports, as well as again, a few reports that I think kind of slipped through the cracks and we wanna point out in case you haven't seen them in a while. And a few things that I think are especially relevant this year, now that, I don't wanna jinx us, but now that COVID, we seem to be entering back to a world more similar to pre-COVID than during COVID. So some things we're gonna to have to readjust and, and pay attention to again. Some, uh, something else, grant keyword search is a way of filtering some of your reports that we occasionally get questions but from folks regarding how to run reports for smaller groups of classes. And this is a way you can do that. And it's existed for a while, but I think it, it deserves some attention today. And then some of our help options. So we'll go ahead and get started. So first, the class interaction slash delivery model, which also it gets displayed on the hotline. This is something that is associated, this is a class descriptor, basically, that's associated with every class that you create in SID. And what the screen you see here is the class creation screen or the class edit screen. And what we have highlighted is the toggle for what we call the class interaction. And until late fall last year, the options under that toggle were group or individual. And that was tracking something that we had put into SID a long time ago and, and hadn't paid much attention to. So we decided to actually change this field to track the ways that the classes interact or the delivery model as the MDE folks refer to it. So the options now are asynchronous distance, hybrid, hybrid online only, high flex, in-person, non-instructional, and synchronous online. And the impetus behind that was obviously so many classes went online and in various versions of sort of online, hybrid, et cetera, particularly during COVID, that we wanted a better way to describe the ways in which the class is, is meeting. Not, not only for our own purposes, but also for potential students when they're looking on the hotline, they, wanna, they might be searching just for online classes or they might be searching for in-person classes. So we needed a way to do that. So this field is now required. So when you're creating a new class, you have to select one of these options. And also, of course, if you ever create a class or you're using an old class, you can go into this edit screen and edit this field as well. So let's take a quick look at what those mean. It's a little complicated. Um, we worked with the MDE and a small team, a little bit with the DL folks to uh, determine categories for kind of pretty, try to cover all the classes that you may present in ADE um, and how they might fit into these different categories. So this handout that you're looking at, this green chart here, I'm sorry, chart with the green heading anyway, is, uh, is, um, is a list of the different types of class delivery models, 
On the left-hand column is the descriptor and sort of the, the definition of what that means. The middle column shows you how that's gonna appear if somebody searches on the hotline. So if somebody searches for an in-person class, then the hybrid style class and the in-person style class will appear. Um, and then if they search for online, hybrid, online only, et cetera. So Susan says she remembers being asked about these definitions a while back. Yep, we had to kind of do a little bit of squeezing certain classes in, and we, we, we think we did a good job of fitting all class potentials into these categories. And then on the right-hand column is examples of the types of classes. So I'll just look at a quick and easy one. The um, synchronous online, which is on the bottom here, that's all when all instruction is delivered synchronously online via a video conferencing system such as Zoom or Google, et cetera. That's, that type of class is going to appear if on the hotline the person who's searching for classes toggles the online button because they only want to see online classes. And an example of that type of class is that teachers and students meet online only via Zoom, et cetera. Okay, so this handout also is, I think Mary just put a link to it, and that will be uh, available. I should put that in the SCED app. I don't think I have yet. I put a link to our, um, to the actual presentation. So you can see when you're looking at a class, you can see on that screen that I just showed you a minute ago, you can see what you have toggled for the class. You can also see what type of classes or how they're designated when we go to the hotline and do a search. I'll show you that in a moment. And then we do have a report, which I'll show you when we get to the um, report section that shows all your classes in your system, all kinds of information about each and every class, including which class interaction you have selected for the class. So that's a, where, that's a spot where you can go and quickly eyeball all your classes to see if you've tagged them properly and if the tag that you like chose makes sense. So we'll take a quick look at how these classes, how this information appears on the hotline. So if you're familiar with the adult literacy hotline, when you go to the address right here, this is the adult literacy hotline hosted by Literacy Minnesota. It is pulling all its information about ADE classes around the state from SIN. So we added these new section right here called class types. So if students are searching for, say they're looking for GED classes, they can click that in the class subject area. And if they are only want online, then they can click online and it's gonna filter and limit their results to just online programs that offer online classes in GED. Okay, so that's how it appears over here, this example of Vietnamese social services. After a search result, you can click on the site and then it shows the classes the program offers currently and in the near future. And it shows the category that we just discussed, whether that's gonna be an online or in-person class. This search result looks like a person was looking for either. They didn't narrow it down by online or in-person. So we introduced this last fall. We did some trainings. We got everyone to go in and edit their current classes because they were all using the old lingo. And then we turned this on, I think around January. Okay, so the next recent update and new feature is the e intakes or otherwise known as online registration as well. And because today we're just doing kind of a quick over, over summary, just the highlights, um, I just want to point out that you can go see a deeper dive into this feature of SID by clicking on this link, and that'll bring you to the webinar that we did specifically on this topic. Because this is kind of a pretty in-depth um, option and feature that you can use. I think I've heard from programs that use it, and they find it very useful. But it's, um, it, it, there's a lot involved. So we'll go over the highlights right now. So I've div div divided these slides a little bit by what the public sees and then what you see behind the scenes in SID. So first, these online registration option, the e-intake is available also through the hotline. So potential students can link to an online registration form that they can get to by a link that will appear on your hotline page that is the results of when somebody does a search for programs in Minnesota. So potential students can click on this start registration button that'll appear once you've turned it on, and I'll show you in a moment how to turn it on. 
And when they click that registration button, they will get to an online registration form, which I'll show you in a, in a moment. But I just wanna also point out that if you have your own ABE website, you can also grab the link from the start registration button and put it on your own website if you wanna directly link folks to it without having to funnel them through the hotline. So when a student clicks the start registration button, what they will then see is the basic online registration form, which starts with the Tennyson warning. And then it goes into a couple screens. There's four of them, four steps, which asks the very basic registration information that we are required in order to create a student record in SID. So first name, last name, ethnicity, birth date, um, work status, that kind of thing. We try to keep it as simple as possible, but we also had to keep it pretty basic so that every program in the state can utilize this. So there aren't really your specific program. If you have additional questions you'd like to ask, they aren't on here. We are looking into maybe making one question available at the end that people could customize, but that's still to be determined. So this is what the public sees. So they see that button on the hotline to start the registration, and then they can go ahead and start filling out the registration forms. And this is gonna collect, once they complete that, all four steps and hit submit, it's gonna send their basic registration information to your SID data system. Quickly, before I show you how it appears on your SID data system, I'm gonna show you how you turn this on. So everybody in SID, when you go to your SID database, if you have admin rights, you will have this hotline tab on the right. If you click on that, you see all your subsites. The ones that are green are your subsites that are turned on and available for the hotline to view. If you click on the one that you would like to add an online registration option for, then you see this screen, which is your general hotline display information. And there's this toggle, display e-intake form. Right now it's blank. If you give it a click and then click save, that'll turn on that registration button and that whole process that I just showed you a minute ago. So it's very easy to turn it on. And if you do it for a while, and maybe in summer you wanna turn it off because you don't want people registering, you can come here and just uncheck that box and then it'll be turned off. So it's very easy, this option exists. You can just turn it on when you're ready. Then when you turn that on, in addition to that registration button appearing on the hotline side of things, you will now also have this new tab here that says e-intake. When you click on that, you're gonna see a screen that looks similar in some ways to your screen of students. It's a grid. And once students start filling in that online registration form and hitting submit, their information will populate this screen. And we've grayed out obviously um, names, et cetera, but what you're gonna see last name, first name, just the very basics in a list here. And then when you click on each name, you'll get more information about the student. So we'll take a look at that next screen. So once you've clicked on one of those names, you're gonna have a, the e-intake information screen that looks like this. It's gonna list their last name, first name, everything else that they filled out about themselves on the registration process. So you can take a look here and this shows you all the questions that they were asked. Now from this screen, you have two options. One is you could do the person search. So the nice thing about this screen is it already populates the person search box that you should all be familiar with. When you do any sort of new student in your system, we ask you to do a person search to make sure that if they already exist in another program in ABE or even in your own program, this person search process will find them. And then instead of recreating the wheel, you can either import that student from a another program in ABE or open the record if they were already a student of yours. So this will already pre-populate the person search with part of their first name, part of their last name, and then their birth date. If you click this, then that'll start the person search process. Now we didn't go into too much depth about that person search process today. In fact, no depth <laughs> because that in and of itself is a pretty big deal, pretty big process. So that training that I pointed to you earlier, you can go there to see what might occur when you do the person search. And then the other option from this screen is if you know, maybe you did the person search and you say, okay, this student is brand new. They haven't been in any other ABE programs. I'm gonna create them as a new student in my program. Then if you click that new student button, it's gonna open a create a student form, just like when you're making a brand new student. 
but it's going to already be pre-filled with the person's name, um, address, some of the other fields, date of birth, gender, etc. So this can save you all kinds of great time, and you can double check does everything look like is typed correctly, especially addresses, cities, um, things like that. And then you can click save, and voila, that student who registered with you online, they now have a record in SID. And then from there, you can take the next step. So most programs then from there will then call the student, or maybe you call the student before you even make that record to verify that they really are somebody who wants to register for your program. So this is a really kind of robust, big new feature. And like I said, if you are interested in, in using it, uh, feel free to ask us more questions. If you have more questions, take a look at that webinar that we did last winter and, and see if you think this might be for you. Any questions on that? All right, we're gonna move along then. To the volunteer training options. So within the last uh, year, year and a half, the volunteer policy um, was updated and they made new requirements um, for what sort of trainings that volunteers need to attend in order to um, be an official volunteer in classes, especially classes that count hours, if I understand it. Now, I'm not an expert on that policy. So if you have questions about the volunteer policy, feel free to contact Literacy Minnesota and Rob. Um, but I am an expert on how you might track that info in SID. So that's what we're covering today. So we updated the list of items on a volunteer record so that you can track all the required trainings and additional trainings as well. So when you um, are looking at a volunteer record, just like with a student record, they have these different tabs across the top. And just like student record, they have a history tab. So if you go to the volunteer history tab, then you have the form across the top here and you would select the date of the volunteer training that your volunteer attended. And in this drop down, you select ABE volunteer training. There's only a handful of options in this drop down for other volunteer things that you're tracking about your volunteers. And then under the history item are all the new um, newish options. They've been in there since, I want to say last winter. Um, and they are the core modules one, two, three, and four. If your volunteer started in 2021, I believe they were exempt for that, for the trainings that year. So you can select that if that qualifies. Um, the foundations of adult education tutoring, foundations of volunteering adult education classrooms, ongoing training, and then various targeted modules. When you click save, oops, you can't see it on this, but there's also a comment box. So a lot of programs like to put a little comment in for um, some details about the core module, or if you're tracking ongoing trainings, you can um, put in comments about exactly what type of training that was. And then click save, and this will save in the history, just like any other history item for staff, students, et cetera. And I should point out that you are required to now track the volunteer trainings that your volunteers have attended starting last month, July 1st. So we also have a report, which I'll get to in a moment, that you can run. You can see all the trainings that your volunteers have been to. And I'm not sure if the state intends to ask you to complete those kind of reports, but I think the, the purpose of getting it all in SID is so that everyone's tracking everything in the same kind of format and same way, and programs can indeed then run reports to see which of their volunteers have been to which trainings and what date, because I believe some, some trainings do sort of expire and then volunteers have to attend again. Is that right, or is that just staff? I hope I didn't misspeak. We'll take a look quickly at I that report. I think that's just staff, Jenny. Okay. I think volunteers, volunteers, if they're counting, if, if their work is going to be used to count for contact hours, have to do the 12 hour training. Right. Or the do they have to modules, renew that? Right. But you don't have to renew it, but okay. you do need to do ongoing training every year. And right. I can't remember if it's one or two hours worth of training. It's something like that. But you don't okay. have to redo the pre service. All right. Thank you. Right. 
so once you've started tracking all your trainings in here, then when you on the report tab of SID, there's a new report called volunteer training report. And you can run that and it's going to show all your volunteers, the, the history group they've been in, which in this case is ABE volunteer training, and the history item. So all those different types of trainings um, will appear in this column, the date that they went to the training, and then any comments that you put. So also one feature of this report is you can either sort by, in this display that I'm showing you, is sorted by the volunteer's name and then their history item. So it's gonna show, so if you have a volunteer here, it's gonna show the various trainings they've been to. You can also toggle this and the other option would be, it's gonna show the history item and then the volunteer name. So if you wanted to search how many of my volunteers have been to the ongoing training, then it's gonna sort it by ongoing training and then all the volunteers who went to that and what their dates were so that you can keep a handle on who's been to what and what dates they went. And also thank you, Matthew, for answering that question. So that was the volunteer training. Sorry, I moved along very quickly. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is this little small feature that I think is useful, but I think totally snuck through and a lot of folks didn't get a chance to hear about it, which is the remote instruction link. With so many classes being offered online this past year, we and, and programs having um, a class link, maybe it's the Google Meet or whatever, that is the link that the students have to have in order to attend the class, they have to click on that link. Someone, uh, one of the programs asked us if there's a way that we could include that link in the class description. So we did add that option. So if you go to a class um, in SID, so we're looking at a class called GED Prep, you scroll down that page all the way to the bottom, there's this gray little box that says remote instruction link. And this example doesn't have one in there right now, but if you click edit, this other box will pop open. And here's where you're gonna put the URL or the web address for that class and where students need to go in order to meet online. Now note, do not put HTTP or HTTPS colon slash slash. <laughs> Just start with the WW or start with the first words of the URL. Then if your program uses the student portal and your students log into the student portal, that link will appear there for them. So if you're a program that uses that and students are familiar with that, this is a nice way for them to have that link available. So I'll show you that in the next screen. So this is how it looks from the student portal. So the student portal is found at sid.mnabe.org slash um, student portal. Katrina asked, would that appear on the hotline? No, we don't put that on the hotline because that's a little bit more public and we wouldn't want folks um, just popping in on the class uh, who weren't supposed to be in it. So the portal, when you first log into the blank student portal page, the student puts in their email address and their badge ID. That's how they log in. And then this, we're looking at Marsha Brady's student portal page. And if you click on the current schedule, Marsha can look at her schedule and any class that has um, one of these remote links associated with it will have a little button or a link here that says remote access. So perhaps you'd find that useful. And then some program, a program that asked this did say that they occasionally have to change their link because, um, because I think of these Zoomer bombers that you might be talking about, Susan. And so this way they can just go in and change that on the class description and anyone who goes to, <laughs> goes to um, their student portal will have access to the updated link. Yes, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. She likes to go to remote classes. So that's a little quick highlight on that. All right, next I wanna take a quick um, review of some, a couple of updated reports and then some other reports that we think might be particularly of use to folks. And we just want you to remember some reports that exist. So the first one, thank you, Linda, in the chat. She said that remote access is cool. <laughs> the first report I wanted to highlight today is actually not per super new but I'm not sure how often it gets used and it's called class summary hotline content report. So like all the reports I'm showing you at the beginning section of this, 
these, you can find the links to these reports on the reports tab. And I know our report tab and list of reports is getting pretty long, but there's a section of class-based reports. And this one is called the class summary hotline content report. And the reason it is called that is because for every class you make, you are checking off what the content areas are, whether it's ESL, GED, et cetera. And this report was, the initial reason for this report is so that we could list all those content associated with the classes. So you could eyeball all your classes and see if you had selected the correct content for all of them. Well, this one's ESL, this one has GED and math, et cetera, et cetera. But then we started adding more additional info to this report. And it's just a really, I think a really nice thorough summary of all your class info. Now, of course, when you go to SID and you go to the classes tab, you see your classes and the name and the teacher and the dates, but there's just not enough real estate on a computer screen to have all this other additional info. So this report shows everything, not everything, but lots of things associated with the class. When you run this report, it's going to default to today. So it's going to show all your classes that are active right now, but you can adjust those dates. So if you wanted to run all your classes for the last program year, you could do that, you can adjust the dates and it's gonna show you everything that was active throughout the year. Um, I see a question, but I'm gonna keep going, Mary, if you wanna to get to that. Also, I hope to have time for questions at the end. So if we can't get to that, Leanne, we'll get to it at the end. So this shows the class attendance type, whether it's lab or scheduled, the class time type, whether it's contact or DL, DL program. So if it is a DL class, you can see which DL program, such as MobyMax, is, is associated with it, whether it's displayed on the hotline. And then I have a little highlight here for the class interaction, since that was the newest piece of info associated with classes. We wanted to highlight that. So you can, again, double check that you've been tagging those appropriately. And then this report scrolls on and on and on to the right and shows you all the different content areas associated with the class as well. Another report that was new this past year, based entirely on a request from a program. One program asked us for it, and then it just seems like such a useful report that we made it available. And this is called the GED and Diploma Recipients with Demographics. So similar to, we do have a report called the NRS, um, NRS Goals Report, which shows students who receive the GED or obtain a GED, I should say, or one of the diplomas. But this one has the additional information of summarizing the demographic information of those students. So I, I don't know if there's a common report that maybe community ed programs request, but it seemed like several programs are interested in getting the um, demographics of this specific group. So what it's gonna do is gonna run all the students and you can run this for participants or enrollees within any date range that you want. And it's gonna show all those who pass the GED or got the local credit-based diploma or the state-based diploma, summarizes just them in numbers up here. But if you click this plus sign, you're gonna have all the details of the demographics for each of the students in those categories. So you can go ahead and click all those plus signs and get all the info you want. If you want to do some of your own data um, comparing and summarizing, but if you wanted just a quick snapshot, at the bottom half of the report shows the breakdown of race, ethnicity, gender, age range, primary language, and whether they are US born or not. That's a pretty nice little report. And another additional um, piece of info that we added to a report that is kind of near the end of the report, so we kind of snuck it in. I wanna make sure folks are aware that it exists. If we have a report called the Staff and Volunteer Information Report, and we usually highlight this every year, kind of at end of the year program, to make sure that you are reporting accurately the number of staff you have, the number of volunteers you have. And you can look at this report called the Staff and Volunteer Info to get all kinds of detail to double check that people are tagged properly with their exit and entrance dates, et cetera. We added on the last page of this uh, staff demographic charts because folks were asking about that. And I know this, the MDE and Literacy Minnesota, et cetera, are interested in programs. And probably you are too, interested in tracking your staff demographics, which was something that is optional in SID as far as putting that info about a, a person. But there's more and more in interest in tracking that info. So we added nice little demographic charts at the end.
So a few other reports I wanted to highlight are what we call oldie but goodies. Um, and also I think reports that you might particularly be interested, like I said, now that um, we seem to be coming out of some of the worst of the COVID era. So this report, some of you probably run this all the time. Some of you maybe kind of once a year run it and you kind of forget about it. So it's called the site five-year attendance report. And when you run it, it's gonna show all your attendance month by month for the last five years. So no matter what date you run it, it's just gonna look back five years and that's it. So this also is on the reports tab in the attendance report section. And I, what I want to point out, it's particularly interesting right now because of the year of COVID when all hours and attendance crashed, you can get a sense of how much you are building back month by month. And you can compare it to three years prior, which is the year before COVID and see if you're starting to get close to those numbers again. So I think it's useful in that way. Another report that is just is also not new, but becoming relevant, more relevant again, is the program-wide assessment history report, which is a report also on the reports tab. And when you run this for your entire program, it's going to show you all your students, their most recent tests in the different categories, and then all kinds of other details, how many hours they've had since that test, their score, their whether they have enough hours since that to test again. It's going to be highlighted green and say true if they've had 40 or more hours since that particular test. <laughs> There's a COVID one. It's going to show you if they have a level gain yet in that exact subject that's on that line, or if, you ha if they have a level gain at all. And it shows you their pre-EFL in that category. So this is a really useful, but it's full of lots of information. And I also included this top part when I made the screenshot because you can filter by a lot of different things. So if you only want to see students who are ready to post test, you can toggle that and only show the ones who are going to be eligible to test. You can narrow it down if you just want to look at TAB. You don't want to see any CASAS results, et cetera. So you can play around with that. Now, one thing, if you are a large program like you know, St. Paul or Minneapolis or even Metro North, <laughs> which is a pretty big program. One, this is going to run pretty slow for your whole program. So I suggest running it for a subsite. Two, this is the kind of report that might be more useful for you to have your teachers run. And I'll show you in a minute where they can access their own, although you can run it by individual classes from the screen as well. But with for the last couple of years, testing has been de-emphasized a little due to the inability to get students in to test and the option to put the COVID sort of, um, that COVID test, quote unquote, that was sort of a placeholder for testing. And now we're back in, we really need to get students tested. We need to get them post-tested and we might need to start showing results again. So I think people are gonna be wanting to look at this type of report a lot. A couple other interesting reports that I think people might find useful is something called the student traffic in classes report. It's very, it's kind of a strange little report, but uh, this has been there for a couple of years and it only runs for one week of information at a time. If you click on it, it's gonna run for like last week, but you can change that date. And it shows you the different time slots of the day, eight to 9 a.m., nine to 10 p.m., or sorry, 10 a.m., 10 to 11 a.m., et cetera, et cetera. And how many students were in classes. Um, during those time slots. So you can see what are the busier times of day for this program, busy in the morning, then quiet in the afternoon, and then picks up again in the evening. And it's kind of helpful to see this one looks pretty consistent across the week, but some programs like to see this to get a handle on our, our Tuesday, Thursday classes. Are we busier those days or Monday, Wednesday, et cetera? It's kind of a nice snapshot. And then we have a report that has a lot of information that we've had a few requests recently for pieces of information that turned out they already existed on this report. So this one is called class rosters with exit types. And it's again on the program um, reports tab. And it shows all your classes and it shows everybody who was ever in it, the start date in the class and the end date if, if they've left the class. If you put an exit type, if you put a comment, when those students last attendance was and then addresses so we've had programs ask us i want to be able to 
get the contact information for everyone who left this class in the last month or something. And you can do that from this report. So sort of like quirky little um, subsets of students you might want to um, find, you could maybe use this report for. And then quickly, I always like to remind programs, especially bigger programs where um, you might not have a data person or you have a data person doing stuff, but you might want to push some of this um, pulling of info and looking at especially assessment histories and stuff to your teachers. I want to remind you all that um, in any class view, so we're looking at the GED prep class, normally teachers go directly to the attendance page and they take their attendance, but there are these other tabs and they do have a report tab where there are a handful of reports that they can run that are specific to their class. So one is that assessment history class. I'm sorry, assessment history report. So it's just like that assessment history report I showed you a moment ago, but this one's just for their class. There's some assessment history graphs and bar charts. There's other fun reports just for teachers. So I always like to remind you all that that's there. And then speaking of assessments, there's one other way that teachers looking at their individual class, they also have an assessment tab that really quickly shows them all the students in their class and their most recent test in each subject area. They can toggle, they can filter, they can sort on this screen and they can even export to Excel. So there's a lot, this kind of a pretty robust little screen of info for teachers. So another way for your teachers to get involved in, in being um, on top of the testing of students in their class. I was going to maybe have time for a quick activity for folks to run reports and report back to me, but I'm not sure. I'm going to move on, and if we have time at the end, I'll have you do that. Otherwise, after this session, before you forget everything, go ahead and go to your SID and run one of these reports. If it's something that's new to you, just take a look at it. If it's something that you have run before, but maybe it's been years or you haven't thought about using it in a particular way, go ahead and do that while things are fresh in your mind. I do have one question that came to me um, on the side, and that was wondering about level gains um, and post-test reports by race. And actually we do have a report on the report tab, um, the level gain um, and post-test history report. If you look at that on the report tab on the, our list of reports, there's one right below it or two below it. And it's the same report, level gains in post-test history and with demographics. And you can toggle some of the demographics. So the person who asked me that question, if take a look at that and let me know if that works and otherwise shoot me an email. Finally, we get a handful of questions this, I would say a year about folks who want to run reports for a different kind of subset of classes rather than just perhaps a subsite or their whole program. So maybe we, we call this grants because maybe you get a grant um, that is for a particular set of classes and you, you need to run some reports just for that set of classes. So you, or maybe it has nothing to do with grants, but you just want to run report on all the classes that are in the morning and they aren't in their own subsite or all the classes in the evening. That's the example I'm gonna show you. So many of the reports in our system, um, the level gain report, the table A report, the, some of the attendance, the all classes and attendance report, those kind of reports have this option that says class grants like, and then a box, and normally this is checked, this null is checked. So you can't, you don't fill anything in, you just run your report. But if you uncheck the null box then you can type something in here and then it's gonna filter this report by that word that you typed in. Now, if you do that right now, nothing's gonna happen unless you've set up your classes. So now I'm gonna show you how to set up your classes with a keyword and then this report will then run by any class that has that keyword. So. You're looking at your class. So we're looking at a class called GED Prep. And at the bottom of a class, if you click on the edit screen, um, so we're looking at the edit a class screen. Now also, if you create a brand new class, the screen looks similar to this. 
and you maybe you've zoomed right past this box that says grant and you haven't paid attention to it. Well, this is what you can use to allow that filter that I just showed you on the previous page to work. So go ahead and you can edit the class and you can type in a word, say, for example, AM for morning. And then you click save. And then that word will now be associated with this class. You're going to want to do that for all the classes in the morning or whatever other grouping you're trying to put together. So open all those classes, type in the keyword that you want to use. Um, you can also use phrases. If you want a phrase to be the whole word, you can use an underscore. Then, now when you go to that report, if you type the word AM or whatever keyword you used, and then you run this report, it's only going to run the report for the students who are in the classes that have that keyword in there. So this is a way to group classes for reporting based on something that's unrelated to the subsites. Subsites is an automatic kind of subset of your classes, but this is a flexible way to create groupings for reports. And then before we go, we are really running out of time. We always want to remind everyone about our help options. So when you look at the SID page on any screen, the very to the right is a help button. Click that, it'll bring you to our help website, which is chunked into different subject areas, person search, students, general interest, or you are looking for something, like, say you want to look for grants, because I just showed you that really quickly. Now you want to come back to help and get more information. Type in grants, and it's going to pop up a list of our help articles. Um, based on your search criteria. This section is, I'm going to back up for a sec, this SID training and support. If you click on that one, that's where you're going to see all kinds of articles, video lessons, specifically to help you with um, training, how-tos. There's links to previous webinars. So webinars are here. There's links to even sessions that we did back in person. Um, I want to point you to these video lessons that we have chunked together. There's one called Video Lessons Admin Level Login. We have Video Lessons Teacher Level Login. The start here is Video Basics for New Users. I see apparently. Oh, OK, sorry. I'm looking at the chat on the side as I'm talking. I see that somebody just asked about some good basics video. This is great. That's a nice video covers all kinds of content. Um, and then the video lessons, they're chunked out into little chunks. And then coming soon, Mary is working on some really amazing videos that we are calling the new SID orientation series, SOS. And we're going to like create chunks in a nice um, format so that you can take pieces and plop them into some of your onboarding trainings for your upcoming staff or new staff or refreshers for fall, et cetera. Hey, Jenny, and if, we are yes. at time. We are at time. Or 2.45 if you're Mary, where you are. Um, <laughs> you do have a question uh, from Mary Kate, and it looks like Mary, maybe Mary answered that in the chat. Okay. All right, thank you for the time and warning. Upcoming trainings. We're gonna do a SID data cleanup, September 14th. So look for emails on that. And we're doing um, session at the Spark Conference um, in November. We're gonna do one about testing strategies and using your data and said to target students, et cetera. And that is all. Thank you. Don't forget to reach us at SID support at literacymin.org. If we didn't get to something that you wanted, definitely contact us there. And just a Thank reminder, you, Susan. a copy of these slides is available in the SCED app. So you can go download that anytime and get all those links. And I am now going to stop the recording.